Hi. <laughs> my name is Pokey Rule, and I program my computer using my voice. I started voice coding a couple years ago um, after decades hunched over a computer had left me with a repetitive strain injury, which made it painful for me to use a keyboard. It's no longer painful for me to use a keyboard, but I still program by voice. So today, I hope to show you that voice coding is not intimidating, it's fast, and perhaps most importantly, it's a lot of fun. We're gonna be doing that by doing a deep dive into Cursorless, a um, spoken programming language I came up with a couple years ago to leverage the unique characteristics of voice as a medium for editing code. So to do that, we need to start by understanding what are those characteristics. Then we'll dig into the Cursorless engine, which is the real core of the talk today. So we'll talk about things like targets and actions, marks and modifiers, and scopes. Now, none of these words probably mean anything to you in the context of Cursorless, but hopefully by the end of the talk today, they will. We'll dig in a bit to a particular way of defining scopes using an amazing piece of open source software called TreeSitter. And we'll finish with some future for directions for Cursorless. I'd like to begin with a quote. Requiring one medium to imitate the other inevitably pits strengths of the old medium against weaknesses of the new. And so to understand why this quote is relevant, um, helps to understand a bit about the context in which Cursorless sits. So Cursorless is built on top of an amazing piece of software called Talon Voice, which lets you basically do anything on your computer with your voice. Um, you can define custom grammars to do whatever you want. And so when I arrived on the scene, um, there was a large community grammar that was built that people used to, well, do it, control their computer completely, but also to write code. And um, it was great for writing code in a straight line, but um, it was very much um, in the mold of the way you write code with a keyboard. Um, and that means that like the advantages of the keyboard became the disadvantages of voice and the advantages of voice were unutilized. And so I created Cursorless to try to leverage the unique characteristics of voice to make something which is as fast or maybe even faster than coding by a keyboard. So let's understand voice as a medium. First of all, um, we have this thing called a language center in our brain, uh, and it was evolved over the course of millions of years, and it's extremely powerful. Uh, and what it's designed to do is to take simple concepts and to compose them together into arbitrarily complex concepts. And so to leverage that, we want to build composable abstractions that really take advantage of this. Rather than having 26 or 100 and whatever keys you have in your keyboard, we have thousands of words, which can be composed in interesting ways. On the other hand, it's higher latency than a keyboard. So this may not always be true. Um, you know, Talon is gonna keep improving and the latency will go down, but the way it works today is you issue a command, there's a slight delay, and the command gets executed. And so no matter how slight that delay is, we wanna try and amortize that across multiple commands. If you just keep issuing a bunch of short commands, that latency is gonna really eat into you, which is not a problem with keyboard. So we wanna try and design for chaining long commands and building complex concepts, which can do a lot in a single command. And finally, after those two million years of evolution, I guess it's still going on, but then you spend however many decades learning a language, right? And so you have grooves, your brain is grooved on particular words, concepts, et cetera, and you have muscle memory in your mouth for how to say those concepts. And so we want to use those rather than fighting them. So I'll give you an example. Um, these grammars are customizable and so there's a command to put a new line before something, which the default is drop. I played volleyball in high school, so I call that spike. Because to me, it's very visual, very much evokes the concept of putting a line before something and spiking it downwards. So we want to try and figure out how to leverage what we already know. Okay, let's talk about Cursorless. Cursorless is a spoken programming language for manipulating text. So um, I think it's good to start with like a really obvious uh, table. So on one axis, we have spoken versus written. And another axis, we have natural versus programming. And for those of you who are not familiar, here's some examples of natural spoken languages. We use the same term for natural written languages. And here's some written programming languages. I'm guessing none of this is new. Mostly, I want to point out that Cursorless occupies a different niche from all of these, which means we're going to leverage some of the things that 
work well with natural spoken languages because it's spoken, and some of the things that work well with written programming languages because it's a programming language, and then some things that don't really make sense for either of those. Okay, um, at this point, six minutes in, we haven't issued a voice command yet, so um, let's just get that out of the way and break the ice. So here's our document, a document you've probably seen before uh, many times, every time you learned anything uh, in programming, hello world. So let's say we wanted to take the first token in that document and put quotes around it. So I'm gonna go ahead and issue a voice command. You'll know I'm issuing a voice command because I speak slightly differently when I do it. Um, if, when you start voice coding, um, you wanna think about the way you issue them. Don't speak like a robot. Um, so trying to speak naturally really helps with voice, uh, voice coding. Quad wrap harp. Okay, great. We issued our first voice command. Okay, with that out of the way, let's talk, so this talk is gonna be a lot about the semantics of cursors in a programming language, less about the details of how it's implemented and more about, let's say, the platonic form of cursorless and really how you use it, what it does, what are the semantics. But before we get into those high levels, let's just say some practical things. Cursorless is open source. Um, it is MIT licensed. Go make money off it, do whatever you want, um, it's free. Uh, it's not a toy. Um, it, most of the lines in cursorless were written by voice using cursorless and there are people in top companies all over the world using cursorless, you probably have used software which um, was written in part using cursorless. Um, and it's funded by user donations. Um, so uh, it gives a lot of flexibility to work on crazy out there stuff, but also um, keeps, uh, keeps, keeps me honest and working on things that uh, users care about and that people actually care about. Um, and uh, finally, I mean, no sweat, but it's available for like 20 plus programming languages, maybe 25, so like whatever language you're using, we probably have cursorless support. I'm guessing at this conference, there's people using all kinds of languages, so if it doesn't have support, it's like one to two days to implement, and it's a lot of fun. So <laughs> if you wanna roll up your sleeves um, and mess with some parse trees, you can, you can add cursorless to your own language. Okay, cursorless has five core abstractions. And I'm just gonna say them in a sentence that will make no sense to you. A mark emits a target that proceeds through a pipeline of modifiers defined using scopes. An action operates on the final target. Okay, pay attention to those emoji because they're gonna keep appearing over and over again. Let's see that again visually. A mark emits a target that proceeds through a pipeline of modifiers defined using scopes. An action operates on the final target. Now, um, this is right to left, not just for the benefit of our Arabic speakers. You'll see later why it's right to left. Let's start at the end. Actions and targets. Back to our famous hello world. And the core concept in cursorless is the notion of a target. So let's call this target harp. We'll talk later about why it's called harp, um, but for now, just take my word for it. So, Every cursorless um, command has an action performed on a target. So if harp is our target, going back to our original command, quad wrap harp, harp was that target, and quad wrap is an action. And what quad wrap does is it puts quotes around the target. Now, the reason I call it, this called quad is because to me those four little quotes look like quadruplets and visual things like that work for me. It may not work for you, you can just customize your grammar. Quad wrap harp. Great. Going back to our document, I lied a little bit when I said that a target, this target is just hello. So that's actually one aspect of the target harp. It's called the content range. But targets are objects which have other attributes. So in addition, harp has an attribute which is called the removal edit, which is how do you remove this thing, right? And notice that's something that the target itself knows how to do, so that the action isn't responsible for knowing that, oh, tokens need to have spaces removed, otherwise your document looks like garbage after you remove the token, right? So chuck, for example, is another action, and chuck applies the removal edit. Chuck harp, great. Back to our target, and let's look at one more attribute of that target. This is what's called the before insertion mode. And what that does is it takes harp and it turns it into a destination. So if I wanna put something before that target, harp knows how to do that, right? It knows I'm a token that's part of a white space delimited sequence. So if you wanna put something before me, it's gonna be really awkward if you don't put a space. And so harp is responsible for knowing that, not the action which is responsible for what gets put there. So to make that more concrete, 
If we have an action paste before harp, harp is that target. Before says, hey, harp, give me your before insertion mode because I want a before destination. And then we have paste, which is obviously going to look at your clipboard and paste before harp puts your clipboard before the token and puts a space there because harp knows it needs a space. OK, back here. And let's look at how a different action uses the same aspect of the, of the harp target to put something before it. So this is called bring. What bring does is it copies a source to a destination, right? So in this case, bring is our action. And now it needs another target, right? Let's call this target look. And bring looks at the content range of its source. And then it looks at the insertion mode of its destination. And I say, bring look before harp. And you can see that that source appears before, the, uh, before our target. One more, um, one more action before we move on. Um, this one is called move. And move is a lot like bring, but instead of looking at the content range of its source, it, looks the, it uses the removal range to figure out how to remove it because it's going to move the source. Move look before harp. Cool. So where are we? We've learned a few target attributes. We've learned content range, removal, edit, and before, which is an insertion mode. We've learned a few actions, quad wrap, chuck, paste, bring, and move. And we've also learned the non-trivial interactions between those two columns. So quad wrap looks at the content range of its target. Chuck looks at the removal edit. Paste looks at the before, at the insertion mode. And bring looks at the content range of its source and the insertion mode of its destination. And finally, move looks at the removal edit of its source and the insertion mode of its destination. And you may or may not have noticed that, in fact, this is a bit of a lie because move actually also needs to look at the content range of its source to figure out what is going to appear before the insertion delimit. So we actually have, it looks at the content range of its source as well. OK, that's all well and good. But where do the targets come from? Um, I just promised you they're called harp and, and but like, where, where do they come from? So to understand that, we need to move to the beginning of the pipeline. And so these are what are called marks. And they're ultimately where every target comes from. So let's go back to our targets harp and look. In reality, your document would have little hats on every token in your document. And that hat tells you how to refer to that token. So if there's a hat over an H, then we use our special word for H, which is harp, to refer to that token. And if there's a hat over the L, we use our special word for look to refer to that token. These are two words in the Talon phonetic alphabet, which is a lot like the um, international phonetic alphabet, but a lot faster. Um, so two syllables is an eternity in voice coding um, if you're doing it all day. So these are all one syllable. Um, and they're designed to chain very nicely with one another so that you can rapidly code. So these are called, um, this is a particular type of mark which generates targets, and these are called decorated marks. Now, I want to point out that at this point, cursorless has really lived up to its name. Um, we haven't used a cursor <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, but uh, lowercase c cursorless is not the same as uppercase c cursorless. We do use cursors sometimes. Um, and it's just kind of a convenient thing to have around if you're focused somewhere to have a cursor. So if you want, Let's say we have a cursor. I can refer to that cursor or that selection as this. For example, if I say, if I have copy this, then this refers to wherever my cursor is. Copy is an action, which in this case mutates the clipboard. Copy this. All right. Great, that's all well and good, but what if I want to refer to the W as my target? Well, like, we can't just have a word for every single character on the screen because that's going to be a gigantic vocabulary. And this is where we start getting into compos compositionality. So let's start with what we already have. We have look. And now we introduce a concept called a modifier. So first car look is going to give us that W. Look being that mark that we already know. And first car is a modifier, which takes its input and just its input is, it takes its input and turns it into the first character of that input. Note though, first car look is not a command. So like don't install Talon and cursorless and say first car look and file a bug report. It's not gonna work because every cursorless command needs an action and a target. That's just a target. Let's add an action. Post 
is now, so on the one hand, we've introduced that you can have the cursor be a source for your pipeline, but it can also be the sync at the end of the pipeline, something that modifies your cursor. So what post does is it puts your cursor after the target. Post first car look. Cool. Moving on from here, um, let's look at another modifier, previous token. So previous token will take its input and its output will be the token before its input. Now, continuing to dig into this compositionality, we can chain modifiers. So I could say first car previous token look and that will give me the first character of the token before look. As in take first car previous token look, which would select that first character. So take just selects its target. Take first car previous token look. Okay. Now, you may notice that these little symbols along the bottom here look familiar. Coming back to that slide at the beginning, this is our pipeline. Now you can see why I wrote that right to left, because this is the way that the pipeline actually runs when you speak. Now, the fact that it runs right to left is actually completely arbitrary. It's just, again, leveraging the fact that um, I am a native English speaker, and in English we speak in verb, adjective, object um, order. If you had a different word order, probably would, it actually wouldn't be too hard to change it so that it was reverse. Um, so to run this pipeline, look outputs a target, which then goes through a modifier, which goes through another modifier, which is operated on by an action. Okay, I'm getting tired of this document. Here's a bigger document. Um, this came from a real user, um, a question how to, how to do this. Um, I, presumably this user does something with thermodynamics, but uh, it doesn't mean a lot to me. Um, and what they wanted to do uh, was to clone the first argument in each of these function calls, right? So this was, this was the start of the document and the output document was supposed to be this, okay? And so the question is, can we do this in one command with cursorless? And obviously the answer is yes, otherwise I would not have chosen it as an example. <laughs> so let's assume um, that we have a hat on that T there, right? In reality, you're gonna have a hat on every token in the document. So, but let's put one on the T there and leave the other ones out because we don't care about them right now. So, spoiler alert, that's the command. Um, breaking it down, we have trap as the source, we have, um, or mark, uh, we have every instance and arg as the modifiers and clone is the action, okay? Let's see what happens as we run through this pipeline. Let's give ourselves a little bit of space to work. And starting here, somewhere familiar, trap is just one of those letters in the alphabet which outputs a target, okay? Then it runs into every instance. And every instance is an interesting modifier because unlike all the modifiers you, and marks you've seen before, which take one target in and have one target out, every instance isn't like that. It has one target in and in this case, it has four targets out, okay? Then arg is faced with these four targets. Now, what does arg do? So arg takes its input and expands it to the smallest containing function call argument, okay? Now, that was all singular, right? One argument, it's expanding that, that argument. I mean, but it's got four. Well, so cursorless says, fine, arg, I know you don't know how to handle four targets. I will just make four of you, and each of you will handle one of the targets, okay? I want you to pay attention to what happened there because I'm gonna come back to it when we're talking about what paradigm cursorless is as a programming language. Okay, expands, to those, expands each of those targets. Then those come to clone, which also doesn't know how to handle four targets. Some, tar some actions do, but clone doesn't, so we make four of it, and that's what's gonna come into clone. Before we finish this command, I wanna zoom in on just one of those targets to understand what clone does, because I think clone's kind of an interesting action. So clone looks at the content range of its target to understand what is, so clone basically takes its content and puts it after the target, right? It makes a clone of it. But in order to know how to put something after it, it also needs to look at the after insertion mode of its target. And notice that this time it's not a space. This time it has a comma and a space, right? And the reason is because arg, which constructed this target, knows that it's part, not only did it expand to the argument, but it also created an object which knows that, look, I'm part of a comma separated list. If you wanna put something after me, you're gonna need a comma. So when I, when I clone this, I get this, right? Cool, so to finish the command, clone arg every instance trap. Okay. Let's check in again. This is where we were last time we checked in. 
we picked up a few new actions. Clone, copy, post, take. In addition, we picked up a new insertion mode, after, okay? And then we picked up some totally new things, right? We picked up marks, the hats, right, which are a cursorless mark, lowercase c, and we picked up this, which is a way of referring to your cursor and loading up a pipeline from where your cursor is. And then we learned a few modifiers, first char, previous token, every instance, and arg. Zooming in on those modifiers. And in particular, I wanna call out a few words in those modifiers. Car, token, and arg, okay? Those are what we refer to as scopes. And the best way to understand what a scope is is to see it. So token is an example of a scope. Another new document. From the perspective of token, this is what the document looks like. It's just a sequence of tokens, okay? Car is another way of looking at our document. It's a sequence of characters. Paint is one of my personal favorites. Um, it's non-white space sequences, right? So it just goes until it hits a white space. Round is a nice one, which basically is a pair of parentheses. And this is the first time we start to see that actually these things can be hierarchical. Now, up until now, all of the, to all of the scopes that I mentioned are what we um, refer to as dumb scopes, and it's not an insult. Um, we'll dig more into what it means to be a dumb versus a smart scope, but they're both important. Let's do some smart scopes. Arg is a smart scope, right? It knows about your parse tree, right, and that what a function call argument looks like. It also can be hierarchical. And let's look at one more to highlight another aspect of these scopes. Right now, we were just looking at the content range of these scopes. So for example, callee, in this case, is the function that's being called when you call a function. However, callee has something else which is called its domain, because say is the function call argument not just for those three characters say, it's, it's the, the, the name of the function being called for the entire function, right? So that's its domain in which it is the canonical callee of a function. And these can also be nested, right? So although to and say are not nested, their domains are. And we'll show a bit how to use these domains. Okay, so those are scopes. How do you turn scopes into modifiers, right? Because in the pipeline above, there were no scopes. You had, you had marks, you had modifiers, you had targets, right? So we need to use these to construct modifiers. So let's say we have a document and this is where, this is our source, right? So we want to construct a modifier which is gonna do something to this source. Next token, that's an example, which will take its source and it will output the token after its source. Previous token will output the token before its source. Two tokens will output the two tokens beginning at the source. And first token will be the first token on the line containing the source. Um, token is short for containing token, right? It's just the token that contains it. And finally, every token, one input, but its output is a bunch of targets, which is every token on the line where its input was. So these are a bunch of modifiers. And in fact, really these are just instantiations of parameterized modifiers, where you take next or previous or two or first or every, and you give it a scope. So what we looked at was the first column of this table here, right? But there are more columns to this table, otherwise I would not have made it a table. Any of these different scopes can also be applied with each of these. So just to make that um, concrete, and also at the same time to show you how domains work, callee, where I've taken the callee scope and I've turned it into a modifier, if I say callee, that is going to refer to the function call, the function of the function call that I'm currently sitting in. Similarly, next callee, we'll jump to the function call after this one. Now, notice there's some interesting semantics when things get hierarchical, because you might have expected to jump beyond the one that contain you. Those are just decisions about what's most intuitive, but the, but the beauty of a table like this and compositionality is that once you understand the semantics of next with respect to hierarchies, then it's the same across all of the different scopes that exist in cursorless, right? And so this is why compositionality is so important, because we can take simple concepts really learn their semantics and combine them to get a combinatorial explosion of different things that we can say. However, you're once again going to be frustrated if you just spin up Talon and Cursorless and just say Kali, 
That is not a command. So in fact, not even is it a target. It's a modifier, right? So what I need to do is take callee and sandwich it between either modify, we need a source, a mark on one side, and we need an action on the other side, right? And just so you don't think we don't have lots of actions, I've used a new action. Um, this is called change, and what change does is it just deletes the content range of its target and leaves your cursor there in case you wanted to change it. Change callee this. And one more thing to point out is if the mark is this, then you don't need to say it. So we could have just said change callee. And so this is where you see that cursors are not required, but they're useful because they can save you a, a word or two, right? Because if your cursor is in a function, I just say func to refer to that function. I don't need to use one of these decorated marks. Let's talk about tree sitter. Um, so tree sitter is a real-time error tolerant parser. So I'm guessing many of you are familiar with parsers, but I'm gonna break this down anyways. So just pointing out real-time and error tolerant are very important for our use case because this means that as you're typing, character by character, or rather you're not gonna be typing, as you're voice coding character by character, we have a live up-to-date view of the tree structure of your entire document. And moreover, it's error tolerant, right? Because as you're coding, your document's gonna go through phases where it's not a syntactically valid program. And TreeSitter is designed to localize those errors so that we can still operate in the rest of the document. So let's look at this uh, document again. And let's look at its parse tree. Okay, so this might seem intimidating, but this is basically just a dialect of scheme, and it's how TreeSitter represents a parse tree. So let's walk the parse tree to understand what this actually means. This is the outermost node in the parse tree. It refers to the whole function call expression. Zooming in, here's the function that's being called. Here are the arguments to that function call. There's the first argument. There's the second argument. Note that this second argument is itself a function call expression, which has its own function and its own arguments, the first of which is identifier. That's our parse tree, okay? So what do we do with this parse tree? Well, we use it to define smart scopes, okay? So this is the smart scope I mentioned before, Kali, right? And it has this content range and a domain. So looking at the parse tree, these are the relevant pieces of the tree, right? We have a call expression and the function that's being called, call expression, function that's being called. And so how do you take this and define what Kali means? Well, TreeSitter has this beautiful pattern language for defining the patterns that we care about in a parse tree. So we just kind of take that, ignore the children we don't care about, which is not parenting advice, <laughs> and we then go and annotate them. So we can say, callee is the function that's being called, anything that's tagged function, and callee.domain, we just tag it as the whole node. And now, once we give with those three lines, we get all of the next callee, previous callee, three callees, et cetera, just from defining those three lines. We can also, def there's a scope visualizer which can show you in real time in your editor what the scopes look like, whether the scope is present. All of that comes from those three lines. And so this is the power of these tree queries. Okay. Grudge match. Dumb versus smart. If you recall, this, the dumb scopes were token, line, round, and paint. There are more, but those are the four I introduced you to. And the smart ones were arg, kali, func, and oh, I didn't introduce you to func, sorry. That's the function, that's a function. And state is a statement, okay? Now, like I said, dumb is not a slight against a scope. Because like, dumb scopes always work, right? Like, I don't need a parse tree, I can be in a text file, I can be in a comment within a, a program, right? Like, I don't need, it, they, just, they just work, right? Like token, paint, et cetera. Take them with you wherever you go and you know they're gonna work. That's kind of nice. You don't have to think, right? And so like, this is maybe something to call out, that like, when you're voice coding, the like, smart part of your brain 
is thinking about code, right? And so the part that's left for voice coding is your lizard brain that's like really dumb. And it's great at being like, oh, that's round. Or like, that looks like paint, right? And like, so when you're, when you're voice coding, you don't wanna have to be using the smart brain. What's left is the dumb brain. And so these scopes, you tend to find yourself reaching for time and time again, just because you don't have to think. And finally, you can get nasty with dumb scopes, right? Like with, with and this is maybe worth highlighting as a difference to other structural um, code editors, right? So cursorless is a structural programming editor, right? Like we're using parse trees and doing manipulations on them like GUI-based um, like smart editors, but we, when we don't want that, when like, you know, sometimes you just gotta roll up your sleeves and do nasty stuff with your code, right? You like, you know, delete all the commas to turn it into like pipes and types you want to take, like there's like things you're gonna do that aren't gonna fit as part of your parse tree, right? And so to be able to roll up your sleeves and just get it done is actually a nice attribute. And so on the other hand, smart scopes are very powerful, right? Cause we had those like, we have like every where we can like look at the parse tree and we can do manipulations and moreover, they leave you with valid code, which is one of the big benefits that people talk about with these sort of structural text editors or structured editors. But I like to think that cursorless gives you the best of both worlds, right? Because you can mess around with just raw text whenever you want to, go into kind of like, let's say, Vim mode on steroids, or you can get this sort of beautiful structured text editor. Okay, and so the last real, I guess, contentful uh, slides here is trying to dig into um, what paradigm is cursorless. So cursorless is what is referred to as tacit programming or alternately uh, the point-free style. So I'm guessing a lot of you don't know what that means. And so we're gonna go back to this slide that I told you to put a pin in. Remember when we had these four targets that were coming into ARG and we just made four copies of ARG? Okay, to understand why that's interesting, let us take this voice command and rewrite it as JavaScript. Trap, let's make it look like a function call. Okay, and that's just gonna output the target trap. And then we're gonna to wanna to take the output of that and we're going to run every instance on that. And then we're gonna take all of these outputs and we're gonna map them through containing arg. And this is where we start to understand what point free means. Because this is not point free, this is JavaScript. And you can see T is kinda of like the X of an XY pair and that right hand side is the Y. So what we're doing is we're defining a point on a graph. We're explicitly referring to a point. And so what point free means is that you don't have to do that. You don't refer to points. And so to finish this example, we would then call for each on that. And like notice there was a lot of syntax here. Um, we had to say for each, there's parens. I'm not gonna read this out every time I'm voice coding, right? So instead, we switch to a point free style where implicitly we're operating on the inputs and iterating over them as necessary rather than explicitly saying what happens to each point of our input. And so to con continue down this road to show you how this turns back into a cursorless command, well, containing we don't need to say, as you saw earlier, we can remove all these parentheses and stuff, and we get back to clone arg every instance trap. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit more about point free style um, because it has its detractors. Um, <laughs> and I think there's some validity to, its, to what people say, right? So it's very terse, it's very powerful, but it's not easy to read. Like I've looked at some tacit code and like I feel really dumb when I look at it. Um, <laughs> and so I, I, like if we look at tacit programming language that, that are out there, um, they're beautiful languages. They're not widely adopted. Except for two. <laughs> and so to understand why bash is a tacit program language, if you think about it, if you pipe into grep and pipe into sort.u, you're not referring to points, right? You're constructing a pipeline and implicitly it's, arguing, uh, it's operating on each of its input arguments. Similarly, JQ, uh, which is one of my favorite programming languages, um, fairly widespread adoption in the data science community and um, again, you can do some extremely powerful things. JQ is probably the, the strongest inspiration for cursorless as a spoken programming language. We very, very similar to the JQ execution engine. Um, 
and you can see a J in JQ, we construct these pipelines. JQ is great for these little one-liners. Not so great for stuff like this. This is real code. <laughs> uh, not proud of it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, fortunately I never had to look at it again because <laughs> I have no idea what it does. So what do JQ and Bash have in common, right? Like why are they so popular but the other ones are not really that widely used? Well, and I think it's because they're designed for interactive use, not for large-scale maintainable programs. And I think that really applies to Cursorless as well, right? With a spoken programming language, I speak the command into the ether and then it's gone. No one has to maintain it and read it and like, they're like max, like just because I run out of breath, I'm not gonna say more than like three or four commands in a single, right? So it's, for this sort of thing where you're doing interactive small short things, the power that you gain from a tacit programming language where you don't have to think about, oh, iterating and stuff like that can make for an extraordinarily powerful spoken programming language. So to loop back to this two these two sentences, which I don't think made sense to anyone at the beginning, hopefully they make sense now. A mark emits a target that proceeds through a pipeline of modifiers defined using scopes. An action operates on the final target. So let's, Let's finish with some future directions. Um, interactive tutorials, um, kind of like what you saw today um, that I built in Keynote, we're gonna build in a uh, web browser that interactively run on the commands that you actually run, and they'll run in VS Code, et cetera. So we wanna make it easier to learn how to use Cursorless because there's a lot there. Cursorless everywhere. Today it only exists in VS Code. Um, we want it to exist in other IDEs. Um, we want it to be able to run on a web browser, VS Code for the web. Um, we want it to run everywhere, um, using OCR or accessibility on your screen to put little dots all over your screen. Um, a more powerful grammar so that we can say even more powerful things than you can there. There's lots of room to grow. Bookmarking targets so that you can have things which commands which sort of extend beyond a single command where you load something into a state which then gets read out so you can do some extremely powerful chains. And of course the elephant in every room is LLMs. Um, so uh, just to throw off a few ideas there, um, a, a, an action which applies an LLM prompt to a target. Um, scopes which are defined by LLM. So for example, the sentence scope is actually really hard to get right unless you have something intelligent looking at it. Um, English to cursorless, right? <laughs> you say something in English and it tells you what the voice command is. And of course, everyone's favorite, chatting with your docs. Um, so I think it's important in talks like this to end with vague and uplifting platitudes. Um, <laughs> so I guess I wanted to point out that when I first started voice coding, before I got there, I was kind of left out in the cold, right? I mean, all of this software was built for people who can use their hands. And here I was, just outside, couldn't use my hands. Um, but in the process, I built something which now is a completely different way of editing code, and in a lot of ways is much better than what you can do by a keyboard. So I just kind of wanted to point out that maybe we should try to figure out how to amplify these marginalized voices to figure out truly innovative things that don't exist because they don't work for the status, people where, for whom the status quo is working. So um, you'll probably notice I didn't do a live voice coding demo, which you may or may not have been disappointed by, but I'll just give a shameless plug for my YouTube channel so you can go ahead and uh, uh, see those if you, uh, if you wanna see me voice coding at full speed. Um, and at each voice, in each voice coding video, at the top of the description, there's something called the command decoder you can click on, and it will show you a scrolling breakdown of every single command that I run to make it a bit easier. And keep in mind, it uses my custom grammar, so don't be too intimidated. We have lots of resources to learn how to get there. This is after two years of voice coding. So um, uh, you can find me on GitHub, find me on Twitter, and here's a link to Cursorless. Um, thank you so much, um, and happy coding.